following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, congressional Democrats launch a sweeping new probe of President Trump, one that could shadow him through next year's election. And sorting through the devastation and searching for victims as dozens remain missing in the aftermath of that deadly tornado in Alabama. Plus, Alzheimer's doesn't just hit the elderly, but here's the good news. No matter your age, you can stave off its effects. Dr. Sarah Gottfried unveils the ways you can keep your brain sharp and your body in shape. Plus, ABC's Paula Ferris reveals the faiths of the newsmakers. What gets them through their chapters of triumph and their chapters of tragedy? What holds them together? and opens up about her own journey. I'm nothing without my relationship with Jesus. Today on The 700 Club. Well, welcome folks to this edition of The 700 Club. I just noticed in the news that the person who's been at, or at least the firm has been at the heart of the opioid crisis, Purdue Pharma, has been hit by so many lawsuits, they're declaring bankruptcy. Well, I wish there was something worse that could happen to them, but it's going to happen. And something else, women, are they at greater risk of having Alzheimer's? And can anything be done to reverse this disease? Well, CBN News has the latest research, and Lori, what do you have? Well, Pat, the answer to your question is yes and yes. And in the moments ahead, we're going to have one of the world's leading women's health experts tell us everyday tips to alleviate the things that steal our joy, weight issues, depression, muddled thinking, and yes, even Alzheimer's. So ladies, it'll change your life. Well, the Democrats are on a fishing trip targeting more than 80 people in their latest probe, a massive investigation ranging from the president's campaign to his taxes to his business dealings. And what I am saying right now is I think they're outside their constitutional authority. And uh, uh, one of the people being named is our dear friend Jay Sekulow, who has been the counsel for the president. And what I would suggest, I don't want to tell him what strategy to pursue because he's a brilliant lawyer. But it seems like to me they ought to go into court and demand a declaratory judgment from the court and to find a sympathetic uh, court, whether the D.C. Circuit is it or whether it's another circuit, but to find a, f a friendly judge and sue Congress. So instead of those congressional people going after all the people involved with Trump, the people involved with Trump ought to say, you are exceeding your constitutional mandate. Show us the evidence that is justifying this extensive type of probe. And I think it might be fun to see it. I don't know, Jay, if you're listening, give it a try, buddy. Terry? Well, these investigations are forcing the White House to spend all its time and energy defending itself. And they could dog the president and the Republicans all the way through the 2020 election cycle. Heather Sells has more on that. On Monday, the House Judiciary Committee launched a widespread probe looking into a possible obstruction of justice, corruption, and abuse of power. The president calls it ridiculous. Are you going to cooperate with Mr. Nadler? I cooperate all the time with everybody. And you know the beautiful thing? No collusion. It's all a hoax. House Judiciary Chair Jerry Nadler is orchestrating the investigation. The Judiciary Committee sent letters to more than 80 people, including executives in President Trump's real estate companies, administration officials, and members of his inaugural committee. Even family members, including sons Donald Trump Jr., Eric Trump, and Jared Kushner, were targeted. The committee also is asking the FBI and Justice Departments for documents on possible pardons for Michael Cohen. The Wall Street Journal reports today one of Cohen's attorneys approached Trump's lawyers about a pardon but was turned down. It also wants documents on hush money payments Cohen arranged during the campaign to two women who allege sexual encounters with Trump. Nadler says the requests, due in two weeks, 
are a way to begin building the public record. Our job is to protect the rule of law in this country. Remember, we are uh, talking about a situation where for two years the Republican Congress did no oversight on the administration. Another probe will examine private conversations between the president and Russian President Vladimir Putin. It's all part of a democratic strategy to flood the White House with requests and keep the president on trial publicly right up until 2020. I hope we get something done besides investigations aimed at impacting the next election. The president's press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, is calling the probes a fishing expedition. The president says Democrats are terrified that their Russian collusion charge is crumbling. They don't have anything with Russia. There's no collusion. So now they go and morph into, let's inspect every deal he's ever done. Although the special counsel's Russia investigation is winding down, these new probes signal a Democrat strategy of distracting the White House and its resources through the election season. Heather Sell, CBN News. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we only have one president, and he is the one in charge of foreign policy, he's in charge of the military, and he's in charge to see that the laws are faithfully executed. He is the executive, and if the executive is handcuffed by these enormous amounts of uh, inquiries, it's going to cripple our nation. What good will it do if our economy is in trouble? What good will it do if we suffer uh, in our relationship with our foreign uh, allies and adversaries? What good will it do? What are they accomplishing? What are they accomplishing? How can you say you're a loyal American when you're trying to cripple your nation? What are they accomplishing? Well, we're doing our oversight. Yeah, baloney. I don't believe one word of it. It is strictly Democrat politics in the worst form, and it is not American. It is not helping our country. And if you and I are concerned, I think what you ought to do is write your congressman, let them know you're not in favor of all these uh, senseless witch hunts. But what I said earlier, I really think that the guys under these, well, there's subpoenas for all this information. It's time for them to hit back. Get declaratory judgments in friendly suits and and sue over and over again. I mean, make the Democrats go to court and defend themselves, because this kind of stuff should not stand. Well, in other news, America's relationship with Israel could be a big issue for Democrats in 2020. John Jessup has more on that. Thanks, Pat. Both parties have long supported the Jewish state, but recent comments and tweets by some Democratic newcomers are causing headaches for the leadership and grumblings within the party rank and file. Jenna Browder has the story. I think it, what I meant is like the, the settlements that are increasing. And From Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. How has this administration responded? To Alan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, younger Democrats coming into Congress are speaking out against Israel and in some cases being called anti-Semitic. This week, Nancy Pelosi and House leaders are drafting a resolution to address the most recent controversy. Omar is accused of anti-Semitism by leaders of her own party after saying pro-Israel lawmakers are, quote, showing allegiance to another country. This after she was forced to apologize last month for a tweet suggesting APAC, the pro-Israel lobbying group, bought the support of her colleagues. It's all causing a big headache for Democratic leadership and the party's 2020 hopefuls who will have to take up the issue on the debate stage. Absolutely. I think Republicans will make sure it's an issue. I think uh, Jewish Democrats will make sure it's an issue. A.B. Stoddard with Real Clear Politics says this could create a big opening for Republicans, and Democrats know that. They're very concerned about the direction of the party, um, support for the BDS movement, any kind of skepti skept skepticism of Netanyahu is one thing, but to go beyond that uh, and to question the 
the unbreakable bond, I think, is, is really going to cause uh, a lot of strife within the party. As well as potential issues with their own voters. A 2018 Pew Research poll found just 27 percent of Democrats sympathize with Israel, down from 38 percent in 2001. And younger voters are dramatically less supportive than older voters. I think that it is a, it's a big internal struggle that they don't want to make too public. They don't want to have the debate uh, be uh, out in the open, but they're working behind the scenes um, very aggressively to try to make it clear to people that uh, we stand with Israel. A group of prominent Democrats has formed a pro-Israel group to counter any skepticism, but that may not be enough. And in 2020, but President Trump, when he runs next year, he's not going to do nuance. He's going to hammer them over this in simplistic terms that will make it very complicated for the Democratic nominee. Instead of talking about other ideas, Democrats may have to defend and explain themselves on an issue few of them want to address. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. The president is vowing to sign a measure guaranteeing free speech on college campuses, regardless of political leanings. Today, I'm proud to announce that I will be very soon signing an executive order requiring colleges and universities to support free speech if they want federal research. The announcement comes after an uproar over an incident at Berkeley University last month. An on-campus argument turned violent when a man punched a conservative activist. Friday, Berkeley University police arrested a suspect in the incident. The school says it supports free speech regardless of political beliefs. Conservatives say they face discrimination on college campuses across the country. While well, another day of searching for the victims of the deadly EF4 tornado that struck East Alabama, killing 23 people, including three children. The twister, reaching wind speeds up to 170 miles an hour, spun a path of destruction half a mile wide, making it the deadliest United States tornado in nearly six years. Survivors met in the Beauregard High School gym to mourn the loss of family and neighbors and to pray together, still in shock from all they suffered. It's really terrible seeing the destruction that it's caused and seeing the lives that it's scarred and the people it's hurt. And there's really not words to describe the kind of carnage it's wrecked. The Lee County coroner says all but six of the people in the storm have been identified. Residents still are looking for missing family, friends and neighbor. Well, the country's leading cybersecurity publication has honored Regent University. Cyber Defense Magazine named Regents Institute for Cybersecurity among its 2019 InfoSec Award winners. Regent was recognized in the trailblazing category. Security professionals chose Regent among only 200 recipients nationally for this year's awards given to companies and organizations that, quote, create and offer the most respected information, security products, and services. Regent provides hands-on training, giving students the highest level security skills in cybersecurity. And Pat, Regent was one of 200 organizations honored, but out of 3,000 up for consideration. Well, I'm very proud of what Regent's done with cybersecurity. Regent uh, has uh, acquired a cyber range. It is now doing uh, advanced cyber training for the uh, uh, well, the North Atlantic uh, fleet of uh, the Navy here in the Tidewater area, uh, the Tactical Air Command out of Langley. I believe the Defense Department has asked for help. And this training is not only defensive, it also can be offensive. So we're training people to know how to identify a cyber attack that is coming. It is hands-on training and it is most sophisticated as you can imagine. So if you're interested in something like that, uh, Regent is also offering cyber certificates for people to be cyber uh, experts or cyber technicians. And uh, uh, you can, uh, well, uh, you can find what you want to do with calling 1-866-910-7615, Regent University, and it is the Cyber Institute of Regent University, and it is amazing and that they got this award. That's a big deal. Well, congratulations. Well, I might congratulate to everybody. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm just amazing. I didn't really know what a cyber range was till I bought one, and you know, <laughs> so we've got it. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> that's right. great. 
Well, coming up, are women more susceptible than men to get Alzheimer's? We'll get the answer and find out how to ward off the disease, no matter your gender or your age. That's next. Well, contrary to popular belief, Alzheimer's isn't just an old person's disease. While symptoms may not show up until a person's golden years, breakdowns in the brain start decades earlier. Our next guest says a better diet and lifestyle changes can help prevent Alzheimer's and other brain issues. It's not supposed to be this way. Anxious thoughts and depressed feelings rob us of our best lives. Addictions take over our minds. Muddled thinking turns decision-making into an overwhelming task, and we're just plain exhausted. As Americans increasingly complain of these and other brain issues, women experience them at double the rate of men. Leading women's health expert and best-selling author, Dr. Sarah Gottfried, says it's time to repair the brain-body disconnect. In her new book, Brain-Body Diet, she lays out a 40-day plan leading to not only a thinner you, but the calm, sharp, very best person you're meant to be. Well, Dr. Sarah Gottfried is here today. She's with our medical reporter, Laurie Johnson. Let's go over to Laurie and our guests. Thanks, Pat, and welcome, Dr. Gottfried, back to the 700 Club. Thank you. Happy to be here. So you're one smart cookie. You are you <laughs> graduated from Harvard Med and MIT, and you are an obstetrician and gynecologist, so you're a woman's health expert. This new book, by the way, fantastic, read it cover to cover, mm -hmm. but it deals with the woman's brain. And what I found fascinating is that Women's and men's brains are different, so different that if you show people just brain scans, eight out of 10 times, they can say that's a man's brain, that's a woman's brain. So women and men do have different brains. Different brains, I mean, they differ structurally, they differ molecularly, and they differ in terms of function. This is the root of why there's double the rate of depression, higher rates of anxiety, even double the rate of Alzheimer's disease. Which is so upsetting and women, and you can attest to this because you have patients that you see one-on-one -on -one in your office, but also thousands of patients online. And you can say that women are too unhappy. They're miserable. They're depressed. They're overweight. Their thinking isn't right, forgetful, angry stressed out, and then of course, Alzheimer's. But what I love about this book is you say the cure, the prevention is sort of the same for all of those issues and it starts with diet. It starts with diet. I mean, the idea here is that we have to connect the body with the brain. We can't think of those two things in isolation. We need to bring them back together. And you're right, you start with food. And we need to talk about how messed up our food supply is. We noticed that in the Journal of the American Medical Association last month, there was a huge study that showed that processed food increased the risk of all-cause mortality by 14%. That's every type of death increases because of these processed foods, which contain the sugar. So the sugar and the processed foods are enemy number one, right? Absolutely right. I mean, what happens with the processed foods and the sugar is that it disrupts the integrity of the gut lining. When that happens, it can disrupt the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. And so it leads to inflammation in the whole body. It can block insulin, it can make you gain weight. And then it, it starts to cause inflammation in the brain, neuroinflammation. And we know that this predates Alzheimer's disease, it predates depression by a considerable amount of time. When it comes to Alzheimer's, we're talking about a 25 year problem that exists in the brain before you ever have a diagnosis. So how can we prevent Alzheimer's and prevent these d the depression and some of these mood disorders that we're dealing with and also the brain fog with, with diet? What should we be doing exactly? So to reduce the inflammation, you wanna make sure that you've got plenty of vegetables on your plate. So I advise people to eat a pound of vegetables every day, mostly the non-starchy vegetables, 
you want to make sure you're getting healthy fat. The brain is mostly fat. We know fat can be cooling. It can be really, really satisfying. You also want to restrict your eating window. This is incredibly important because I think a lot of people believe that they should have breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks in between. The way that our DNA evolved is to eat within about an eight hour window with an overnight 16 hour fast. We know this helps to clear out the gunk in cells, but maybe most important, more important than anything else, is to control your blood sugar. I want people to care about their blood sugar as much as they do about their retirement accounts because <laughs> your health is your greatest wealth. And 60% of cognitive decline can be prevented by managing your blood sugar, getting it in that Goldilocks position where it's not too high and it's not too low. So you say um, w people should stop eating at dinner time, like 6 p.m. And then when should they pick up eating again the next day? So that would be 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, to have an eight hour eating window, 16 hour overnight fast. Most of the time you're sleeping, so mm -hmm. you can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, what I advise for women is that they slowly ramp up to this point so that they start maybe with a 12-12 a so that they have an overnight fast of 12 hours. And then they ramp up to maybe 14-10 and then 16-8. So you mentioned briefly a minute ago about the gut. What's going on in the gut? We know that we need the good bacteria in our gut. How do we get that? We know that prebiotics are the most important way to feed the good bacteria. You also want to avoid stress. Stress is the elephant in the room when it comes to the body-brain connection. We know that uh, there was just a study released in October of last year showing that women are much more vulnerable than men when it comes to stress. Mm. When you have stress, starting in your 40s, mm. it can shrink the brain, it can reduce memory and also visual perception. So it's really crucial that you manage stress. Stress can poke holes in the gut lining and lead to that inflammation that we just talked mm -hmm. about. And you have wonderful, wonderful tips in your book about ways to manage stress, exercise, sleep, and the list goes on. And you have great tips about how to get a good night's sleep because a lot of people have trouble there. Uh, but I did want to talk to you about hormones. Hormones are a huge issue about why we're stressed out and why we overeat, why we can't sleep. What should women know about hormones? Well, with your hormones, definitely getting cortisol under control. The main stress hormone is key. You also want insulin on your side because that's going to help you with reducing cognitive decline. Then there's the sex hormones. And this is a major difference between the male and the female brain and leads to probably leads to the increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, depression, anxiety. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, those are hormones that you want to have on your side. As estrogen starts to decline in your 40s, that's when you start to see differences on PET scans of the brain. And so I really encourage women to manage their hormones and to make sure that they're on your side, that they're not getting out of whack. And you recommend in your book getting your hormones tested and you have wonderful resources about where you can get the good hormone tests. And also you advise people to take a probiotic, the good bacteria. You have a couple recommendations in here and it's, it's really fantastic information. And what I also loved is you said, regardless of whether you have the Alzheimer's gene, you can prevent this disease, but you need to start early like in your 20s. So young ladies, listen up. <laughs> well, and it's never too late. I, I think that's an important part of this message too, that you can, you can make changes in your brain well into your 40s, your 50s, your 60s. I want women to care about their brains. I want men and women to care about their brains starting as early as possible. What I thought was also really interesting when we talk about the processed foods and those awful ingredients that they put in there, those ones that are difficult to pronounce, I often look at the list of ingredients and think, hmm, I wonder what that is. Oh, well, it's probably fine. The FDA would never allow something bad to be put in my food. But that's actually not true. Some of these ingredients make us addicted to bad foods, make us hungrier, actually even make us more depressed. That's exactly right. I mean, what we know is that about 20% of Americans have food addiction. Most of those are women. And we definitely think that a lot of it is related to processed foods, the consumption of sugar. And so we have to be really careful about getting back to whole foods, getting the fiber that you need. That's where the pound of vegetables comes in. Eating the healthy fats, getting the low inflammatory proteins that are so good and, and make you feel sated, make you feel satisfied. 
A lot of people are like, mm, what is a healthy fat? What types of proteins should we eat? It's, it's a long list and uh, it's all in here. And uh, one more thing before we have to leave is you talk about toxins in the food. There are actually a lot of toxins in our environment. I was shocked to see that there are toxins in the beauty products that we put on, all the makeups and the lotions and the potions and the cleaning products in our houses. Even the perfumes that we wear are, can all be toxic and that adds up. It adds up, so it, it leads to toxic load in the body, and then it can cross the blood-brain barrier. Things like mercury, things like bisphenol A, and affect your brain. So we have to be careful about how we get exposed to toxins, and then we need to periodically detoxify, which is something I cover in the book, so that you're getting these toxins out of your body. You know, a common one that I see is glyphosate. So glyphosate comes in foods that are genetically modified, and it, we know it's associated with an increased risk of anxiety. It can cause disruption of the gut um, brain barrier, and that's just not good for you. And we know that these tips, these things have been tried on thousands of women. They really work. A lot of people are like, oh, I don't know if I should go to the effort to do that. It's probably not gonna work. It really does work. And I wanted to say, for folks who wanna learn more about Dr. Gottfried and her protocol and the brain body diet. I'm going to be interviewing you for Healthy Living, which is a 30 minute program. So we're gonna have more time to talk. And that airs tonight on the CBN News Channel at 9.30 p.m. Dr. Gottfried, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Lori. And back to you, Pat. Well, thank you, man. That's something else, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, you are a proponent of all of that. I so. am. You know, she's talking about glyphosate. That's the ingredient in Roundup. That's why, you know, there's, there's serious losses, losses. against uh, Roundup because they spray it on weeds around the wheat, the corn. It's got glyphosate. And so uh, she mentioned that. That's just one of the things that's out there. But I'm telling you, to try to get what's halfway decent you're talking about cage-free eggs. You're talking about uh, free-range chicken. You're talking about grass special beef. beef that is, you know, grass-fed beef. But you've got to be so careful. And, you know, you read the labels. It's unbelievable yes. what's on the labels. If you see what's put in these things, it's unbelievable. You almost have to start with, like, one one area at a time so it's not overwhelming. But it's, you're right. It's, it's tough. Uh, I'm telling you. Yeah. My head just spins. That's why I wanted Laurie to do this interview. <laughs> I've had Dr. Perlmutter. I've got Dr. Axe. This, you know, everybody's got a diet. But they're all pretty much saying the same thing. Inflammation is a killer. And it's really causing tremendous health problems all over America. All right. Next. Well, still ahead, the ABC host who left the anchor chair to pursue a passion project and now gets celebrities of all stripes to open up about their faiths. I've had a guest on that was an atheist and another that was Muslim, which I learned a ton about, about Islam. And I think some of the more profound conversations that we have as Christians are with people that we don't necessarily see eye to eye with. Paula Ferris talks about the role of faith in her own life and reveals her dream guest. That's next. As a former anchor of Good Morning America and The View, Paula Ferris is no stranger to interviewing the newsmakers of the day. And now, as podcast host, she's still using those skills. Only this time, Paula's asking her guests some very different questions. If God puts something on your heart, you can't run from it. <laughs> or you can try, but it's not, gonna, it's not gonna work out well. So Paula Ferris took a leap of faith in 2018, she stepped down from her successful run as co-host on The View and left the anchor desk of Good Morning America Weekend to pursue what she calls a passion project with the ABC Network, a podcast called Journeys of Faith with Paula Ferris. I really wanted to give listeners an opportunity to hear from newsmakers and um, from influencers. What does their faith journey look like? What gets them through their chapters of triumph and their chapters of tragedy? What holds them together? Paula says her relationship with God keeps her grounded at work in an additional role as ABC senior national correspondent and at home as a wife and mother. During a rough patch early on in her marriage, she relied on faith to keep her family together. We've been married 
18 years now, thank God. Um, but it's been a lot of work and we were just talking about it recently. You know, thank God we didn't abandon our relationship, even though at that moment it didn't feel like there was much worth fighting for. When it came to our marriage, we stuck it out. And I can really only say it's because of God. You know, it's at that moment, neither of us really, even though I had moved out, neither of us had a real peace about it. And so we stuck it out. We have three beautiful kids and we're doing so well now. She says making a distinction between her identity and career was a breakthrough to a more stress-free, fulfilled life. That was the main reason why I stepped away from anchoring GMA weekends and from The View. I didn't feel like I really had much of a work-life balance. It was hard to step away from those two jobs that I didn't realize had I defined me so much. And I just have to remember to give myself as much grace as I give other people and that it's not about being perfect. It's about a journey and to love myself and to love others through it. And, you know, it, it helps too that, you know, I've surrounded myself. My friends really couldn't care less what I do for a living. During her podcasts, she's hoping to empower and encourage listeners through conversations with guests from varying faith backgrounds, including celebrities and influencers like Luke Bryan, Sherry Shepard, and Reza Aslan, to name a few. I've had a guest on that was an atheist and another that was Muslim, which I learned a ton about about Islam, and I think some of the more profound conversations that we have as Christians are with people that we don't necessarily see eye to eye with. And it's important in this moment to sit down and listen to people and respect people, no matter where they're coming from, and show them love. So who would she love to invite for a future episode? I'd love to get Snoop Dogg on, I'm just telling you. He released a gospel album about a year ago He's had this sudden resurgence or rediscovery or conversion to Christianity. And I feel like people don't give him a chance. I would love to have him on the podcast and give him an opportunity to talk about it. Paula has high expectations for the next season of Journeys of Faith. And you know, the first season, it's you try to figure out what works and what doesn't. You try to see how people are gonna receive it. And people, you know, were very receptive to it. And I'm super excited and I know once again, you know, there's that fear, oh my gosh, are people gonna listen? But I know, once again, if God calls you to do something, he'll equip you. Paula Ferris, sharing her own journey of faith as a reflection of God's love. I'm nothing without my relationship with Jesus. And that's the thing, it's not a religion, it's, it's a relationship. And, you know, I just try to ask myself, how would Jesus handle this situation? You know, do people see Jesus in me? That's the thing too. And sometimes I feel like I might be the only Jesus that you might see today and this might be my only crack. So it's just, for me, it's a constant reminder of the magnitude of the responsibility that we have as Christians to love God, love people, and show them the love of Jesus. You can get more information on Paula's Journeys with Faith podcast by going to cbn.com. Well, up next, a boating accident left a man with a fractured larynx. It's absolutely a life-threatening injury because of its effects on the airway. His vocal cord area is swelled, and when you swell in your airway, you die. See why his doctor says divine intervention saved this man's life when we come back. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. A U.S. backed Syrian fighter fighting force are still trying to root out ISIS from the last pocket of territory in Syria. Syrian Democratic forces had to slow their advance on the city of Baghouz because the Islamic terror group is using civilians as human shields. Still, a spokesperson for the Kurdish led forces vowed in a tweet that the battle for the city is going to be over soon. ISIS is trying to hang on to the last tiny piece of land in, the, in eastern Syria, reportedly deploying snipers and guided missiles and using dugout tunnels for surprise attacks. Well, the Nigerian man arrested on a London street for simply preaching the gospel is speaking out following his release. Olu Ilisamini said in a video produced by the UK anti-persecution watchdog group Christian Concern that police came on the scene and yanked me away. Still, he says God was faithful after police let him go without any charges, adding God placed people in his path who helped him get home since he didn't have any money. Olu says he will continue to preach God's word and appreciates the support he's received from around the world. 
Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. You want to see a miracle? I've got one for you. David Beezer and his family had been boating along the Colorado River countless times. So when David went from full speed ahead to a slamming dead stop, he knew he and everyone with him were in grave danger. Well, I'm laying in the ambulance and I'm trying to breathe and it's just, it's getting shallower and it's getting harder and I just couldn't push air anymore. Like it just wouldn't go through. Um, and I just looked up at them and I just whispered, this is my last breath. And that's the last thing I remember. July of 2016, David Beezer lay dying in the back of an ambulance. The high school football coach was in need of several miracles after a boating accident with his family on the Colorado River left him fighting for life. I had been up and down through that area, you know, thousands of times. Um, each trip we would go, that was the only way to get in and out back to, the, to where we were camping or where our house was. The sun was setting and it was coming down at, uh, at an angle. And you, there was a glistening shimmer on the water, but you couldn't tell how deep it was. A sandbar had developed just inches under the water's surface since the last time David had cruised this stretch of the river. He drove his boat onto the sandbar at nearly 40 miles per hour. So we went from just going full speed, you know, with a boat full of people just having a great time to zero within just a few feet. The full force of the collision was right on my neck. I'd hit the steering wheel right at my voice box and airway, and immediately I could feel it was becoming difficult to breathe. My first concern was my family, my kids, but the inability to really, I physically couldn't really do anything um, because I was in really bad shape. And I knew, I knew that I was in trouble. Without medical attention, he knew he would soon be unable to breathe. It became very difficult to breathe very quickly. And I could feel it tightening up and I could feel my airway starting to close. That was the time that, you know, uh, that you really cry out to God and say, you know, I can't do this and I'm gonna need you to see us through this. And the only way that I could have peace was knowing that I knew who held my future. David and his family are Christians. As they prayed, they saw God's hand in their time of need. My wife tried to call 911 and we've been in that area a lot and could never get a cell phone to work from that area. And, and we tried many times in the past, you know, to try to call and check on something back home and never gotten through. That day, the phone call immediately went through to 911. First responders quickly arrived at a nearby boat ramp, but had to wait for a sheriff's boat that was still 20 minutes away. Thankfully, an off-duty sheriff heard about the situation and rushed to the sandbar in his personal boat. If the off-duty sheriff that came for me had not come, with certainty I would have died on the boat in front of my kids. While in transit to a hospital in Yuma, Arizona, he sent a text to a friend from church. I just said that we'd been in an accident and that I thought everybody else was gonna be okay. Uh, and I said that I was in bad shape. Uh, pray for me. Hundreds of people began praying for David as news got out about the accident. Before he reached the hospital, his lung collapsed and he passed out. Dr. Brian Weeks explains the severity of David's condition. What David experienced was what's called a laryngeal fracture, um, and it's absolutely a life-threatening injury because of its effects on the airway and, and the person who suffers its ability to breathe. His vocal cord area swelled, and when you swell in your airway, you die. Doctors were able to insert a breathing tube through the damaged area in his windpipe. He was then life-flighted to St. Joseph's Hospital in Phoenix. David was placed in an induced coma for five days, giving his airway time to heal. The first trauma doctor, when I woke up, he looked at me and said, there's only one reason you're alive, G-O-D. And I knew it. Uh, I had been in that ambulance and, and I knew that uh, I needed a miracle to make it. 
After his release from the hospital, David experienced intense pain and difficulty breathing once again. He was readmitted for an emergency tracheotomy due to a growth in his airway called a granuloma. We describe that in, in layman's terms as proud flesh. It's you know tissue that grows in the setting of, of healing. And you know those, again, in a, in a small area like the airway, that can be very problematic. As doctors prepared to surgically remove the growth, they took another look in his airway and were surprised at what they didn't see. He went in with the camera and the mass was gone and he'd never seen anything like it. He just looked at it and said, you know, it's not there. It probably was divine intervention. I know a lot of people were praying for David and a lot of people were, you know, had holding, holding him up in their thoughts and prayers. David was very fortunate that his granuloma did go away on its own and that saved a lot of time and, and an additional procedure. That's an easy one to explain, you know. God still does miracles. Just a week later, David had his trach removed and was calling plays for Christian high school football in San Diego. Thankful for the answered prayers, and the healing that kept him alive. You know, I have a wife and kids, and he's given me the ability to continue to be a dad. Um, I'm thankful for my friends who rallied for me incredibly, just the, the prayers of uh, school family, church family, um, just the outpouring of love. You never really realize how much you're loved until you go through a situation like this. There's times where you know that the game is beyond your level. And this situation was certainly, I knew that I had no role in staying alive. I mean, it was, it was God's hand and God's mercy alone that would keep me alive. God does miracles, and David had one. Here's something that happened uh, in Bay City, Michigan. Now, for five years, Evelyn suffered from dry eye and all of his daily symptoms. One day she heard Terry pray, <clears throat> said, you have dry eye. Not only is it unpleasant, it's actually affecting your vision. Your eyes are so dry, nothing you've taken has helped. And Evelyn said, that word is for me. And guess what? Her eyes are healed. Well, praise the Lord. Yeah. Well, this is Darlene. She <laughs> lives in Enola, Pennsylvania. She was in horrible pain located on the right side of her neck and her upper shoulder. She was watching this program and she heard you, Pat, say, you've got a neck muscle that's sore and stiff. You can hardly move your head. Touch your neck. In the name of Jesus, you are healed. So by faith, she did what you said. She turned her head, moved her arm. The pain was completely gone. You know, by faith, God brought forth the worlds. By faith, he spoke it into being. Let there be light, and there was light. Let the animals proliferate. May there be fish in the sea. All this stuff, God spoke it. And what he has given to us is the authority in his name to speak the word of faith. And so when that word is spoken in his name, Nothing's impossible. Now, we're going to pray for you, whatever your need is, whatever your need is. And Terry and I will join hands, and we're going to believe God. Father, I join with Terry right now, and we believe God. With you, all things are possible. And Lord, we speak the word of faith. Somebody, you've got a crushed... Uh, your whole uh, rib cage has been crushed. It's like something rolled over top of you, and you've been you've been healed. Is the name Ben? You, you are completely whole, and your chest is going to fill out. Those those ribs are going to be healed in Jesus' name, Terry. Mm -hmm. There's someone you haven't had a trach, but you've had something happen that has um, made it very difficult for you to speak. And God is touching you right now. Just put your hand on your throat where that problem is. Believe God for this right now in Jesus' name. Speak holy. There's somebody you've got blisters on your feet. Mm. Uh, just take those shoes you're wearing off and put your hand on your feet. Those blisters will go down and your, the flesh will be completely whole in Jesus' name.
you know, someone else, you have trouble sitting because you're um, like your your lower, like your sacroiliac area. I don't know if you've been in an accident or you some kind of a crack or something. God is sealing that up, healing it. All of that inability to move and the pain that you feel is going to be gone now in Jesus' name. You know, right now we pray for our nation. We yes. pray for our president. Lord, I know that you said a house divided can't stand, a kingdom divided against itself. But Lord, for this nation, we pray for this nation. We pray for our president. Indeed, we pray for the Congress that we might be one nation under God. Let it be, Lord. May your spirit bring harmony in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Yes, ma'am. Well, still ahead, from the spiritual to the salacious, Pat's ready to tackle your most pressing issues. Al asks, <laughs> if a man and a woman live together for years and are faithful but never get married legally, will they go to heaven when they die? Well, Pat's going to tackle that and more of your questions after this. Well, it's time for your questions. This is from Al Pat, who says, if a man and a woman live together for 15 to 20 years and are faithful to each other, but never married legally, and then they die, do they have a chance <laughs> to go to heaven? Is there any difference if they were previously married or divorced? <laughs> You've asked several questions, all of which are not necessarily uh, germane. First of all, I don't believe that Going to a clerk of a court and getting a, a document is what God is interested in. What's interested in is a commitment, like, I will be your husband, I will be your wife, we will live together and be faithful to one another till death do us part. That's the commitment that God looks for. Now, in that case, you know, I, I think they're, they're no problem. But now you're asking, what were they doing before? And I don't know. You didn't tell me what their relationship. So is the fact that they're together uh, and, and they're committing adultery, that they already have a de existing spouses? I, I don't know any of that. But what, the first question you ask is, if you are committed to somebody and you live together and you, you, you well, they call it common law, your you're common law marriage. Isn't that after seven years or something? Or well, common whatever law? it could be. Whatever that, whatever that <laughs> whatever. law is. But, <laughs> but, the, but for the Lord, it's, uh, when you make that commitment, you know, that's it. Now, it certainly is, if you go to the court or you go to a church, then you have the whole society backing up your marriage. If you don't do that, then you don't have all that society backing up your marriage. So, but as far as you ask me what God says, okay, what's that? Okay, this is Cliff who says, it seems that our president intends to base his diplomatic skills on an ability to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. The question is, is this likely to be an effective strategy to use against Kim Jong-un or any other tyrants he has to deal with? Uh, not really, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's nice to think that we're smarter than anybody in the room. That's what President Obama thought. He said, I'm smarter than anybody here. Well, <clears throat> he wasn't, and nobody is. The Bible says, in the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom and, safe, and safety. With wise counsel, make your wars, what the Bible tells us. And anybody who doesn't seek wise counsel is, is asking for trouble. So I believe in, in, in the counsel of the brethren. I believe in listening to advice. And I think any leader that doesn't surround himself with wise counsel is, is, is asking for trouble. All right. This is Matty who says, is it biblical for a married man who is saved and separated from his first wife to date another woman as he waits for the divorce to finalize? A pastor who I know courted a woman for two years. He was only legally divorced for 30 days before marrying the next woman. Are people divorced in God's eyes once they separate, even if they don't have the legal paperwork yet? Uh, I think you're asking again, uh, it isn't the imprimatur of the state that makes it right. It is the attitude of the heart and what you are. Are you truly together? Are you uh, for life until death do you part? Now, in this case, 
the, the grounds for divorce are laid out in the Bible. They're very clear. You know, there's adultery, there's desertion, and what was called the Pauline privilege. If the unbeliever is pleased to depart, let him depart. The brother or sister isn't bound. So after that, you're asking a person is going to to this a divorce for for apparently scriptural grounds. You're you're trying to tell me, but you haven't got a legal uh, document yet. Is it okay to date? Mm -hmm. Well. I, I don't see any big deal on that why it would be wrong. Uh, but again, it's all those caveats in there. Yeah, the details, the all devil's right. in the details, right? Okay, this is a viewer who said there are so many different Bible versions out there today. I want to know, is there such a thing as having too many Bibles? <laughs> well, actually, the question is whether you, you know, we have certain of what are called codices, as the Vaticanus, as the Alexandrinus, and so forth. And from those codices and the fragments that have been gained thereof, we have pretty close to what's called the autographs. And therefore, we have Greek and Hebrew texts. The, the Hebrew is pretty much fixed by uh, the, uh, and you've got what's called the scepter again, this is the Greek translation of that. But uh, in terms of all these translations, there, you know, it's, uh, there's the Living Bible, there's the one, uh, you know, there are various Bibles. And uh, the question is, how close are they to the original? And if they are good translations, well, praise the Lord. Well, that's all the time we've got. Thank you so much for being with us, and we will see you tomorrow at the same time. Bye-bye.